Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Center Stage. I'm Rajiv, your host, and today I have with me Steve Kaplan, VP of Customer Success Finance from Nutanix. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we get started today, I want to read a quick bio about Steve, um, which is really, he's got a very fascinating and interesting background for those of you who don't know. So Steve Kaplan uses ROI analysis to facilitate rational IT decision making to help clarify architectural design. He founded the customer success finance team at Nutanix, which assists customers around the globe with financial modeling. Steve has co-authored three books on VMware and two, two books on Citrix. Three or was it 11? Well, 11 total editions. 11 total editions, all official guides. He has written hundreds of IT articles, white papers, and several books on subjects like security, disaster recovery, and the effect of regulatory compliance on IT, as well as keynoted at IT venues across the globe. He has also held positions on the advisory boards of several industry manufacturers, including EMC and Microsoft. And he recently just published a new book called The ROI Story, which you can find on Amazon. Yes. And when was this published? Uh, in uh, May. Okay, very recently. So congratulations and welcome to the show again. Thanks. So uh, Steve, fascinating background. Why don't you uh, tell the audience and myself a little bit about your background and your journey and how you got to Nutanix. <clears throat> I started out in the channel partner business, okay. uh, in the industry anyway. Mm -hmm. um, my brother and I started a, a business selling IBM clones and that morphed into Nobel and then eventually we got into Citrix. Okay. I became, uh, we're named the first Citrix partner of the year. Wow. And uh, sold that to a, a company that ultimately sold to another public company and then uh, a few years later started up a, a VMware consultancy. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we won some international awards, and this was with another partner, and after a few years sold that, and uh, then, uh, you know, and, 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 and the books, I think, kind of helped build up some credibility, and, sure. and it was one of three partners in the world on the EMC Pre-Sales Advisory Council and so on, and a Microsoft MVP, and so I moved up to Lake Tahoe, okay. where I kind of just envisioned this... Uh, cushy consulting career. When was this? What, what year are we talking about now? That was... Uh, 2011. Okay, so about eight years ago. Yeah, to, or, or, to yeah, yeah, but yeah, and and not too long after that, early 2012, I got a call from a friend of VMware VCDX who was working for a startup, and he asked if I would uh, interview there. And I, I wasn't really looking to go back to work for anybody, certainly, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I said, well, you know, he's a good friend. So I met with the uh, the CEO and um, uh, VP of Sales uh, to. Um, Obviously, very brilliant guys. I was very impressed, and even more impressed by the technology. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking to myself, you know, they had this uh, basically software-defined storage infrastructure technology, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, if this worked, uh, this would change the entire industry. Mm -hmm. But then I, um, uh, foolishly, as it turned out, I thought, you know, how often does a 50-person company run by by two guys, brilliant but you know, thick Indian accents? How often do they have a prayer against the handful of behemoths, the multi, yeah, the multi-billion dollar companies that have dominated the data center for years? Sure, decades. Yeah, you yeah, know it's been that. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I didn't join, uh -huh. but as I watched them, Nutanix, over the next year, it became evident even to me, you know, these guys are going to do it. Yeah. And so I, I gave up my dreams and went back to work 70 hours a week at a startup. Okay. <laughs> From Tahoe, or did you move back to the No, no, I was... Uh, worked out of Tahoe, okay. on the road a lot, uh -huh. and uh, and that was a little over six years ago. Okay. And uh, but as a lifelong student of business, mm -hmm. and it's been such a a thrill and uh, such a, a privilege to be able to participate and see Dereg Pandey, the CEO, you know, build Nutanix itself now to over well over a billion dollars in revenues, sure. and, and to inarguably have changed the industry. Public company, changing the Public company, changing, yep. and, yep. and to, to just have been able to participate with that for me was just, a, you know, fantastic Yeah, uh, amazing. Adventure. I mean, even though you didn't join at the 50, when it was 50 people, you still were onboarded fairly early. It was about 150 people when I joined. Right, right. And how many people now? Over 5,000? Over 5,000, 5, yeah. 5,000, right? And tell us a little bit, um, at a high level, what does Nutanix do? Uh, Nutanix is, makes software to run data centers, I would say, at a very high level, okay. uh, and to uh, facilitate a, a multi-cloud architecture. Okay. Okay. Um, got it. 
Uh, so let's talk about your books. You, you, uh, you've co-authored uh, a few of them. You've written a new one. What was that process like, and why did you decide to do that? Well, the co-authoring was very different than the solo offering. Uh -huh. uh, authoring. The co-authoring, uh, you know, the VMware books, I, I worked with other, uh, or the Citrix book, I worked with other Citrix experts that I knew. The VMware books, I worked with uh, John Aristid and, and other top-level VMware architects. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always wrote the business sections, so okay. the easy parts. <laughs> uh, uh, and and uh, I thought I was done with book writing, but, uh, you know, when I had my channel partner businesses, we didn't really sell in the conventional manner. We would use financial analysis. I have my MBA and uh, we would use ROI primarily to help customers evaluate different infrastructure options mm -hmm. uh, and including of course the disruptive infrastructure Citrix and then later VMware mm -hmm. so they can make the best decision for their organization. And when I went to Nutanix, even though I joined Nutanix to start the channel partner program mm -hmm. uh, for North America, I was the channel partner program for okay. a few months anyway. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so I, I still used ROI TCO analysis to help customers evaluate Nutanix mm -hmm. uh, versus um, other platforms. And, and so 25 years of doing this, I had a whole lot of uh, experience and sure. it just kind of was bursting out and I felt like I, I had to write a book. And the funny thing is, I actually, I wrote the book uh, and then I was hiking the trails in Tahoe one night and it kind of, the book really read as this great big giant boring white paper. Okay. <laughs> and so I, I was hacking and had this kind of epiphany that a, a good ROI analysis tells a story, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to disruptive infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And the book should do the same. So, so I, I completely rewrote it from scratch to make it uh, more anecdotal okay. of my experiences, of, of my team at Nutanix's experiences. Got it. And, and you know, for a financial book, I think it's fairly readable, put in... Uh, ROI dude, my even more geeky alter ego. He, by the way, his Twitter handle is at ROI dude for those of you who would like to follow him. Thanks. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and, the, uh, and the character that says even more geeky version of myself. Uh -huh. um, and uh, he gives financial tips uh, throughout the book. Nice. The ROI superhero. So people who don't want to read the book uh -huh. uh, uh, can at least see the comics. There you go. Uh, there you Mark, go. Mark Templeton, the longtime CEO of Citrix, graciously, graciously wrote the forward. And, uh, so, so your book discusses the vicious cycle of complexity. Yes. Talk about that. What does that mean? Uh, so that's a, a term I came up with to kind of denote, uh, you, you know, you said it, the the, the, the dominant data center incumbents dominated for, for you know over a decade and mm -hmm. and in, innovative companies like uh, Fusion IO which had uh, Steve Wozniak as, as uh, co-founder of Apple as CTO and was very well funded and IPO'd and um, Violent Memory which is a very innovative approach to Flash and um, you know, lots of other companies, uh, Nimble, Tintry and so on, they either got wiped out mm -hmm. or got acquired. Sure. And you know, before so to understand this vicious cycle, you kind of have to go back to, to before VMware came on the scene, and uh, back in those days, SANs weren't really bought much in the enterprise. It wasn't a whole lot of penetration for the same reasons as today. They're complex. They don't scale well. They're not particularly resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're expensive, and and so where the big market came was what was called the internet companies back in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, Alta Vista. You're talking about in the '90s. Yeah. Alta Vista, Excite. Yeah, Yahoo. Yahoo. Yeah, there are yes. the, the the big. I worked at Excite back in the day, so <laughs> I'm very familiar with this burgeoning boom that happened in the '90s. So keep going. Sorry, to interrupt you. But VMware, when VMware came on the scene, they changed everything, mm -hmm. uh, especially when V V Motion came out in 2003. Okay. Uh, the the first virtual center was called in those days. Today, V Center, the first virtual center manual, 1.0, uh, page 37, had four bullet points. And the first bullet point was the host must share a, a storage area network, a SAN. Now, if you weren't in IT in those days, it's hard to grasp just how magical vMotion was. Hmm. Uh, you know, most people who are seasoned still remember exactly what they were doing the first time they saw it. Right. In my case, I decided with a partner to launch my VMware consultancy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 
up to that point, last few years after the dot com burst, you know, NetApp and EMC, the storage leaders, their sales have been declining. Yep. That that bullet point came out, and organizations around the globe started buying SAMs despite their faults because hmm. they wanted to run uh, VMware vMotion. So that changed uh, everything uh, in the industry. But what happened was there was a handful of manufacturers who emerged uh, as as the as the, the, the SAM providers, uh, and they were complex, but that complexity worked in their favor. So channel partners. Uh, like my business, started in many cases gravitating toward a particular manufacturer and, and their storage products and will learn them well and get certifications in them and so on. Mm -hmm. And then provide professional services at about twice their typical margin to their customers to set up these SANs. And the customers, this whole new class of storage administrators, also would gain a deep expertise in particular SANs products and in many cases kind of get this internal status akin to a, an Oracle DBA. Okay. And so they would like it and they would recommend that if their company buy more of the, the products and the cycle would repeat. I gotcha. And, and with this power, they're able to, to keep almost an oligopoly, we'd call it today. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that was the situation actually into which Nutanix <laughs> walked into. Got it, got it. And speaking of disruptive technology, I mean, why is it so hard for organizations um, to move to disruptive technology, even with strong financial justifications? Uh, you know, IT is on the hook for a lot. They have to uh, provide, you know, of course, very reliable uh, systems. Uh, they have to be secure, which is absolutely important. They have to be high performing. They have to meet with, uh, you know, compl compliance. Mm -hmm. They have to meet what the business wants. Yep. So when they get something that works, <laughs> they're not really eager to, to make changes, justifiably. Sure. And, and so even if a disruptive technology comes along and the, and the numbers look great, uh, they're going to be skeptical because they've heard of other uh, products that, that claim to do great and sure. then have challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's going to disrupt what uh, their, potentially their, their buying cycles, uh, their, their governance procedures. Uh, they may have to alter the organization even. Mm -hmm. uh, so all those are, are inhibitors to getting an organization to move off of a status quo environment and embrace a disruptive technology. Even with VMware, the, the most disruptive technology ever to hit the data center, in 2005, uh, when I started my VMware consultancy, the, the biggest objection we would get from people, IT people, is you will never put my production server into a virtual machine. And... Uh, uh -huh. And a lot of you know CIOs and so on, like I talk about in the book, yeah. kind of pride themselves on getting information from their staff and making the right decision for their organization. But the reality is, if their IT doesn't bring them <laughs> the technology, mm -hmm. you know, they're they're not likely ever to even know about it, or at least know about the attributes. Got it. And so, how do how do these enterprises overcome these these fears or these apprehensions? of moving from what is the status quo to something that's disruptive and innovative um, in a way that's meaningful, that provides the ROI, that makes them comfortable? How, how do how do enterprise finally eventually get there? Because so many of them are getting there now. What is what has happened? Yeah, well, with VMware, it took a long time. Uh, Gartner says that seven years after the introduction of ESX, five years after vMotion, that still only 12% of x86 servers were virtualized. Okay. And again, this was the most brainless uh, new technology ever introduced into the data center. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, IT moves slowly. But, you know, that's what really the book is about. The book is geared toward IT leaders and uh, CIOs, CFOs, uh, analysts, consultants, channel partners, really anybody interested in evaluating disruptive technology. Mm -hmm. and, and what I suggest is using a financial framework to make that evaluation. Okay. And... You, once the numbers make sense, now's the time to wrap a story around it. Uh, what are the, the um, everybody likes drama and they like adventure and they like conflict and resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, Sounds and, like a great movie, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, it, you know, so, so you have to, you don't have to, but it, the most effective approach I've found over the years with disruptive infrastructures to wrap a story around the analysis itself mm -hmm. and grab people emotionally. Mm -hmm. and, and now, a lot of times, they'll be incented to 
to, to, to move forward with the disruptive technology. As an example, uh, early in my career, with, uh, it was a VMware consultants uh, project uh, we did for uh, a large healthcare organization, and, and the numbers look good for, for moving every, for everything to virtualization, but I, I think the thing that really put us over the top was during the presentation to the, the board and the CEO, we talked about how they were running out of uh, uh, cooling mm -hmm. capacity. Okay. And uh, and power because the data center was all full with all these servers, and if they experienced an outage and th they were in Dallas and the hot Dallas summers months were approaching, yep. uh, if they experienced an outage, which we knew they would, mm -hmm. you know, now it means the business is down. I mean, it can even be life or death. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. that that I believe more than the number. We, basically, in that one meeting after years of fruitlessly trying to get monies to expand her small virtualization environment. And that one meeting, the CIO got approval for the millions of dollars she needed hmm. to, to virtualize everything. Wow, okay. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. Um, what are the software-defined alternatives, and, and how does Nutanix play a part? You know, I think to, to really understand that, you have to go back to the 90s when Nutanix was first getting going. Okay. And um, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google, mm -hmm. uh, got a tour of the Yahoo Data Center. The story goes, mm -hmm. and and I don't know why. May, I guess they wanted to show off, sure. um, but but Sergey was not impressed uh -huh. when he came back and talked to his staff. He's he's going, hey, what's going on with Yahoo, the largest NetApp customer in the world? You know, so many of those those NetApps are are not being utilized because of the global distribution of of people, mm -hmm. uh, and um, his team said, well, there's no other way to handle um, separate sets of user data disparate sets of user data. And, uh, and, and Sergey told his team, well, you know, figure it out. So the, they hired uh, this team of scientists from across the country who for the first time took a scientific look at IT infrastructure. Okay. And what they realized is that it doesn't matter how much money you put into hardware and multipathing and so on, hardware breaks, mm -hmm. it doesn't scale well, uh, it's uh, inefficient to manage. Uh, um, it's not particularly resilient. Hmm. And so what the Google scientists did is they took all the intelligence out of these proprietary arrays uh, and, and then put it into software, Google file system using uh, MapReduce. And that changed everything. Hmm. Uh, Storage Mojo, a popular blog site even today, but back then uh, said that uh, they estimated that the Google infrastructure was like one-fifth to one-seventh the cost of Yahoo. Uh, and they said for Yahoo, it was like bringing a knife to a gunfight. And Google quickly you know, rocketed up to be the number one search organization. Mm -hmm. And now every leading cloud provider for their main hosting business uses a, some variant of this model of a distributed file system running on you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of commodity servers, no SAN in sight, mm -hmm. all aggregating the local storage all through software. Well, the lead scientist of the, the team of Google scientists and another Google developer and another engineer were the three co-founders of Nutanix. Okay. And they said, how can we bring, you know, the software-defined architecture that's clearly better, uh, you know, it's one in the much more demanding cloud provider space, mm -hmm. and this was, but this was after, long after vMotion when Sands had penetrated the enterprise. So how can we bring this clearly superior architecture to the enterprise? So that was Nutanix. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, great, 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 great background there. Great see how. <laughs> um, I think most people don't don't know that story. So thank you for for sharing that. Um, so let's talk about your role. Going back to your role as VP of Customer Success Finance at Nutanix, how do you how do you get a good analysis when organizations may not even know their exact configuration, let alone cost of power, or manage and upgrade, got upgraded. Um, and, and that you, well, first of all. Some people are surprised that customers are tend to be forthcoming with this mm -hmm. regarding their information, uh, especially uh, I have a few people on my staff from a very well large well known database company, and they're particularly surprised when they joined us. Say, so, wow, your customers share that kind of information with you. Our customers won't even talk with us because mm. <laughs> they hate us, <laughs> and uh, so um, so that's you know part of the battle. But but many times, yeah, IT people, especially in this. You know, most large organizations not have, don't just have one SAN, they have a lot of SANs mm -hmm. and different models of SANs and then all the switch fabrics and 
everything that goes with that, and and they don't may not even know what they have, let alone the cost, and especially the cost, as you said, of upgrading and so on. Uh, but we have a lot of experience, so we'll guide people, and um, we'll in going through an analysis, you know, we'll say, uh, well, maybe they're they're looking at upgrading the SAN versus mm -hmm. getting rid of it and moving to Nutanix Enterprise Cloud, we call it, mm -hmm. and. I will say, you know, we see for your type of SAN and, and the use case that we would estimate a cost of between 700000 and 900000 and, and because you're going to be using pretty heavily, you know, I'm, we're thinking maybe 850000 as a placeholder. Are you okay with that? And then we can just change it mm -hmm. when, when you learn more. Okay. And, and one of Nutanix's advisors is uh, Professor Maholtra, Deepak Maholtra, the, um, uh, probably the, the leading expert in negotiation in the world. He's a Harvard professor, mm -hmm. and uh, I've had the, been very fortunate to have some of his workshops and read his books. And um, So he calls this concept of anchoring, okay. <laughs> where, where you put in the, the first number, and, that, and people kind of gravitate toward that. Mm -hmm. and it, it kind of a, a funny side, and, and that works, you know, because if you wait for people to come back with the information, you're going to be waiting forever. The right. analysis isn't going to get done. Sure. So we'll kind of power through it, doing this over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. but. The kind of a kind of side interesting note is that after people give the number, a lot of time we 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 see them uh, defend that number <laughs> internally, <laughs> and and even if it turns out to be wrong, sure. they still defend it. It's just the anchor. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah, it's that's, that's just kind of a funny side note. Interesting. Um, let's talk about uh, the Nutanix HCI, the hyper converged infrastructure. Um, what are some key considerations when when quantifying HCI in the public cloud? Um, so, when in terms of quantifying uh, hyperconvergence, a lot of manufacturers, you know, probably almost every manufacturer in the industry has their own ROI or TCO or both mm -hmm. type of models. Uh, and but none of the SAN manufacturers that I've seen incorporate growth into those models. And and there's a simple reason why is because they don't, you know, if you buy a SAN. You have to buy extra capacity for the drive bays, for uh, bigger storage controllers, so that you know, they don't reach capacity. So you have to try and guess where you're going to be four or five years down the road in terms of resource requirements, the length right. of the sand. So you buy the sand up front, and then you have a forklift upgrade maybe five years down the road, but you hope not to have it after just a year okay. uh, because that's very expensive sure. and it's complex and, yeah. it, and it's, it's risky. Uh, so they don't even want to factor in growth. But for Hyperconvergence, at least the way Nutanix does it, uh, growth is, is, is great. And I wrote an article and did a, a, some webinars on buy less Nutanix. And because there's no reason to have to buy a bunch up front because you can start as small as you want as a Nutanix customer, at least three nodes. And then scale as you grow. One node at a time. Mm -hmm. But you actually benefit because of Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. you know, as the hardware gets faster, as you come up with uh, NVMe and 3D crosspoint and Octane and so on, what it means is, is the density of virtual machines per node is actually increasing over time. And so when you model this out over financially, the, the capital expense for the whole project mm -hmm. Decline declines significantly, mm -hmm. along with all the associated OPEX of, of rack space and power and cooling. And there's no risk of ever facing a forklift upgrade. Mm -hmm. You know, if a customer decides she wants to replace her five-year-old Nutanix nodes, then she does it with new hardware that's going to be, you know, probably a third or half, whatever it is, uh, as, as much to handle the same workload. So mm -hmm. customers actually benefit by you know, buying what they need instead of trying to buy way ahead. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. Some great advice there. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, what do you enjoy most about working at Nutanix? Uh, most is certainly the people, and, and not only just the quality of people, but the, the collaboration. Uh, people from different departments will, you know, we use Slack, and they'll jump in and they'll help, help each other, even if it's nothing to do with it, their job or their area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I love being in an environment like that. So... Sounds like a great culture to be at. Absolutely. Okay. Um, if you have a superpower, what would your superpower be? Uh, 
I, I think it would be not being afraid to ask dumb questions. <laughs> Love that. Love that. Okay. Uh, as just an example, we uh -huh. talk about three cheer all the time. Uh -huh. What's that? Uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's a, a centralized storage plus storage network plus compute. Okay. And I had been, you know, seeing it when this was when I was fairly new at Nutanix mm -hmm. uh, uh, for some time, and then it just occurred to me I really don't know what that is, and so I asked. Um, and, and it took some, then there were some actually different answers internally from all these, you know, our experts until sure. we kind of settled on what that was. But I do that over and over again because I don't know so much. Yeah. Uh, I'm not afraid to ask my team or, or anybody or even customers. Sure. Love that. Love that. And for those of you who don't know, um, Steve here actually is also very well versed in yoga. <laughs> uh, he's done 1,801 Bikram yoga classes. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, in uh, 16 countries at 124 studios. Amazing. Tell me a little bit about what, what was the draw towards Bikram Yoga and, and are you still practicing it? And, yeah. 128 now. 128, um, okay. <laughs> you know, my wife, who's a former gymnast, uh -huh. uh, did some yoga and she's always trying to get me to do it. And I, I had done some classes, but I found them to be really boring. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did a, a, a class. I, a friend told me about Bikram Yoga mm -hmm. and I said, that sounds more interesting. So I, I went with her and I thought I'd get some husband points. And uh, in the class, and this is the most horrible thing ever. <laughs> That's what you, your first impression was. Yeah, it was okay. just absolutely awful. Too hot. Just, it was, yeah, horrible. Yeah. Just, yeah, it was just, you know, it's 105 degrees, 40% right. humidity. Sure. And I thought, this is, this is so stupid. Mm -hmm. I said, I will never, ever do this again for the rest of my life. And uh, then the next day, I was talking to her, and I said, wow, I feel so good. I think I need to try that again. Okay. <laughs> you felt the benefits the next day. Okay. Yes, I did. Yeah. And okay. uh, so... Um, you know, for ten and a half years now, have been doing it uh, pretty regularly to, to get to those numbers. And Amazing. I don't see myself ever stop. I have a, I have a cracked spine from my wrestling days, and uh, the beacon keeps it in check, so I can do my snowboarding and mountain biking and other sports. You actually is a perfect segue to my next question, which is: You went to UC Berkeley, fellow I'm, fellow Calgary, yeah. yeah. me too, go Bears, um, and you did NCAA wrestling for a couple of years. I did. Tell me yeah. about that. Well, what, what was that like? It was hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Competitive wrestling at the collegiate level, I mean, that must have been pretty intense. It was, yeah. You always thought high school was hard, and then I got uh -huh. to, to college, and you know, everybody on the team was a former state champion, or multiple state champion, or at least placed in the first three, and I was nowhere near that in high school. Okay. Wow. And uh, But it was good. It was, yeah. it was great fun, and um, I learned a lot, and got tougher. And, uh, That's awesome. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, we, we, we live in the Valley, you live in Tahoe, but, you know, everyone is, is hustling and grinding and working really hard on a daily basis. Uh, what do you do to sort of achieve work-life balance? I don't think I w would say today I really do. Okay. Um, I've been uh, listening to Naval, and, uh, and I really like what he says about meditation. I've never been uh, able to really do that, but I've been kind of following his advice and uh, making some small progress there. So. Hopefully, you're from now I'll be able to answer that. Yeah, it's, affirmatively. it's hard work. It takes a lot of discipline and practice, uh, daily practice, yeah. if you can do it. Um, so that's that's pretty much all the questions I have, Steve. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we sign off? Yeah, if you're uh, an, an IT leader uh, and uh, you're faced with kind of these dual challenges of uh, status quo huggers, people who want to maintain the status quo, or uh, you know, the board who's telling you you got to lift and shift everything to public cloud, uh, the, the best way to address both of those pressures is by doing the math, doing the analysis, and, and coming up with the best solution for the organization. Love it. Do the math, folks. Do the analysis. Get the ROI so you can make a, a smart decision. Um, well, thanks again for your time, Steve, for coming in. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yep. Same uh, here. I'm Rajiv from Center Stage. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Until next time, see you later.